Nope. Joe over here doing? Uh, posting on Instagram about the interview. It's, uh, All right, it's, let's do it. it's exhausting, isn't it? Yeah, if only I had a personal assistant. We hiring for interns. <laughs> Me one. Anyone. Anybody want to be an intern, please. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, welcome everybody for, I don't know what episode this is of The Correct Opinion. The season's been pretty shoddy. I blame myself for that. But <laughs> I had to do one, had to get you back here to at least do this one for the opening weekend for Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Mm-hmm. Um, you saw this movie a couple times now. What do you, like three, four times? Four. Yeah, you can probably start reciting things word for word. A little bit. Wanted to finally get through our own official reaction after everything that we've been through with this whole topic and film and everything that we wanted from this movie versus what we actually got. Now mm-hmm. I'm gonna just start with the gut punch. I mean, Marvel started with the gut punch, so I figured we should start with the gut punch, which is sure. The movie immediately started off with the death of T'Challa. And it was from a sickness, it was off screen, and the movie immediately drives you into the grieving process for that film. And that's, Mm -hmm. you know, I gotta admit, when I was sitting there, I was watching a movie, I watched it on the IMAX at Lincoln Center in Manhattan with a good crowd, it was like a full house, and like everybody else was like all sad and they were clapping when they saw like the Marvel logo come up and Chadwick was all over everything. I ain't clap. And I had very strong feelings about that scene in particular. Um, Mm -hmm. I know for me, it was like, we talked about this and it was about using the, the usage or the imagery or the bringing in real life trauma or pain and, monetizing it right that's like me go to a funeral and then putting it up on youtube and enable monetization that's kind of like what i felt like happened here because you know Mm -hmm. we've talked about how as fans we've grieved uh t'challa multiple times right we grieved him in infinity war we grieved no excuse me back up we grieved him in black panther (laughs) we grieved him in infinity war then when Chadwick passed away, we grieved him again. And then, you know, yeah. after like trying to learn to figure out a way moving forward, Marvel's just like, this time we got to make money off it. Let's put it in the movie. Yeah. I love that the Marvel logo was all Chadwick, but I, I, I did not like feeling like they were making money off of the fact that this man died in real life it just doesn't sit well with me it just sits it's, it's just it's like a bad taste in my mouth it's a it's a little unsettling but i i think this like what you described was my concern from the very beginning right when, when in the recast the child petition it does say don't use the real life tragedy <laughs> of chadwick boseman as a plot device into your movie now no one's saying that you shouldn't talk about grief or talk about mourning it's a, but it's like mirroring everything that happened from the real life situation and putting that into the film like it's hidden way too it's on the nose a little too much you know and like i would say this i would not go so far as assigning motive to what Marvel did. So in other words, I'm not going to be the person saying Marvel went out of their way to make a movie to capitalize on Chadwick's death and monetize on that. I'm not going to say that's their motive. However, (laughs) I can understand how that optics could appear. And that's why I was saying y'all should avoid doing that because for the people that will assign that agenda or will assign that motive, it's hard to argue against it. Because if we're being honest, 
when Chadwick passed, a lot of us, I would say almost everyone that's going to watch this movie grieved and mourned yeah. at that yeah. time. I mean, there's a very big reason why when Chadwick passed, people were, especially little kids, were using their little toys of Black Panther as dying. Like they people mourned already. Yeah, it- vast majority of people mourned already and the thing is we mourned because we knew it was real life now i understand some people are like well we don't want to act like he didn't die you know in the film and stuff and i'm like you're right we don't have to act like that but let's not act as though putting his death in real life in the uh, story was the only and best way to acknowledge that you could have acknowledged it from the opening title yep. sequence at the end of the movie with that tribute with the tribute yep. uh, video that they made you could have done it by just saying you know in loving memory of our friend chadwick in the beginning and the end you could do it in so many other ways where we're not like casually dismissing his presence without saying like nope because chadwick died we have to make t'challa die as well you could have done other things so I completely reject the idea that this was the only and best way to do it because we've seen this in other things too, in other movies where people have passed away and we've found other ways to, um, you know, shout them out or to remember them or to celebrate them. I totally expect something for William Hurt at the beginning of the Thunderbolts movie, right? Just a little something, a little something, something, a little something. Just like, hey, you know, a memory of our, you know, I mean, that would be nice. That'd be nice. And I bet you... It'll be just fine for everybody else. Yo. <laughs> I bet you people are going to be like, yeah. That, so, yeah. I mean, so, so they, they could have done it a different way, right? But we are familiar with, you know, Ryan Coogler watching him outside of the movie and just hearing him speak in interviews. He's a sensitive guy. So I kind of understand why when his friend passed away, he was like, you know what? I'm going to take the movie and do it like this because, you know, I'm. Th- this is how I feel right it, now. It's true for him. Yes. That's he, he, as he said in his interviews, he couldn't do a movie that didn't feel true, didn't feel right for him. Right. So I understand some people are going to be out there like, man, they could have done it during the blip. They could have done this and they could have. But... Clearly, whatever direction they went in, this is the one that he was like, not only is it true for me, but it's also true enough for me to have the cast and crew also be on board because he had to convince them too. yo, I don't I don't I don't like any of their statements in their interviews recently about the whole topic. I, I don't agree with them, but I sympathize with them. I do, too. I just don't like it because they're human. They they. They're, they're humans experiencing mourning and grief. You know, that's nothing. That's nothing to just take light at. Right. I, I remember. But at the same time, and I, I want people to understand this just with this context, because according to Nate Moore in my interview with him, he said that Disney did not force them to do anything. Disney did not say you better have a Black Panther sequel right here, right now. So everything they've chosen to do is on their own accord. So for me, I'm just like, look, while I'm not going to sit here and vilify these people for being human and having emotions, y'all still made a choice to do something for public consumption. So that that's that's kind of a different thing versus I mean, I, doing something in private or whatever. Like now y- y'all made a decision to make a movie that the public has to engage with now. This is no longer people mourning in private. This is no longer a personal matter. Now, it's a public matter. And anytime (laughs) things become public, you gotta take the good with the bad at that point. I agree. I I just feel like, it's not like it's the first time we in film series have seen an actor pass away and the franchise continue. I think the biggest one that I can think of off the top of my head was like the Harry Potter films sure. when that actor, um, Richard Harris, the one who played Dumbledore passed away yeah. and like he was Dumbledore in the first two movies and he was fantastic as Dumbledore. Absolutely. And it was like, Oh my gosh, you, like, what are you going to do? You can't, he, nobody can follow after him. And then 
boom, they bring in another actor, and he's also really, really good in the role. Yeah, almost and to the point and he brought a different version of Dumbledore. Yes, into the into the series. So it's like um, once I think Richard Harris was gone, they found a nice way to honor him. They did a little tribute. They said a little something, but the show went on. It yeah. was another option. That was their truth. I understand with Ryan Coogler, this is his truth. I just don't like it. And that's and here's the other important thing. That's okay. It's okay for you yeah. to not like it. I'm okay. And it's okay for other people to like it. True. And I want people to understand that because I think too many people try to like think that it's combative if we don't just go with the flow with whatever Marvel says or whatever they present. Marvel, because again, I've talked to them directly with Nate Moore, the, is the head boss <laughs> right under Foggy. He said, it's okay if other people feel differently. It's okay. He agreed with recast T'Challa. He said it was a fair conversation. He said it was not wrong. He Man. said he understood the conversation. Man. He also acknowledged that they were put in a state of cognitive dissonance. Yep. That's when like two conflicting ideas collide and you just don't you can't go one way or another. So they say that acknowledge <laughs> that they're in a conflicted position and you know this is so, a corner they've painted themselves in and they're at least they've acknowledged that. So I, I kind of want to move a little bit because I mean yeah. recast Chalo, we everybody knows where we stand on it, right? We we've been talking about this for over two years now. Everybody knows where we stand. Um I love this movie. Let me just kind of preface it with that, right? I think this was a really, really good Marvel movie. I was on my last legs with Marvel. I was like, yo, if Wakanda forever doesn't do the right stuff to bring me back in, I'm gonna check out like I did with the DCEU. I think that they did a lot of things right, but the main thing that they did was borrowed a lot from their past films. So the opening sequence when they had like the army oh, ship wait, wait, that was- Are we doing, are we doing spoilers? Of course. Okay, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Listen, if you guys have not seen this movie, this is a reaction to the movie, we're going in. <laughs> okay. This is your last chance. Otherwise, go check out the movie, come back, and then we'll go from there. But the sequence on the ship, right, at the beginning with the Talokans attacking, I thought that was a really cool sequence. But I'm telling you, I immediately thought of Winter Soldier when that happened. Sure. With Captain America yeah, going through on the, the ship. Boat. Yeah. Exactly. And then yeah. that whole action sequence, it was at night. That immediately m made me feel like they were borrowing from some of the best parts of what Marvel has done in the past. And it's happened. it happens more throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. um, another thing was how like we talked about how Letitia Wright as Shuri wouldn't be enough to carry the film by herself I agree with that especially after watching the movie I think she did a great job but I don't think she would have been enough to carry the film well, and Andrew, hold on hold on because I, I want people to understand what that really means for this film, this is not an indictment on her acting ability. No. I think that it was the writing and directing that handicapped her and limited her from being as good as she could have been in this film because the writing in this film was my biggest issue. It was my, like, there are so many issues with the writing that, like, I think it compromised people, uh, it compromised characters more than people think, but also the editing. The movie does not even keep focus on one. Ca the first act of the movie, I thought, was just all Queen Ramonda. Yeah, the I was about to say, Angela Bassett about, carried it. I mean, and she, she was great. She, she was put great. the movie on her back and carried it. Right. But it was like scattered because the first act, Queen Ramonda. Second act, let's introduce all these characters that need to get Disney Plus series. And then third act, all right, now we'll focus back on Shuri. And I'm like, yo, <laughs> it actually would have been kind of better. If you just kept Shuri as the through line yes. the whole time. I mean, seriously, in the very beginning of the movie, that whole time jump of like a year after. So I'm like, why are you even time jumping? Show yeah. us Shuri dealing with her grief, being angry. I don't know. Uh, um, just doing things that would help inform us 
about her character more. I get it. She's in the lab, but has she been out of the lab? Maybe because all of a sudden now she knows how to ride motorcycles and now she knows martial arts. <laughs> well, she's she's like, been on how to ride motorcycles and she does have some basic, you know, uh, fighting ability. She's not as good as like a Dora Milaje, but she's what, had some basic fighting what, ability. What are you basing this on? Uh, her upbringing as a Wakandan royalty. Was that established in the MCU or are you borrowing from the comics? A little bit of both. Because the comics can't apply. You already know this is a completely different. I term. mean, when the most that we've ever seen her do anything physical was when uh, two times when Killmonger, when she went one on one against Killmonger. And the other time was when in Infinity War, she was being attacked by I think it was Corvus Glaive. And she tried to, like, fight him off a little bit with her little blaster guns. That's but, all she did. That's not fighting ability. You and I could put on blasters <laughs> and shoot at people. I'm not, no, listen, no, no, no. I really Because I, I, I want people to understand this, that it's not trashing her. It's not being misogynistic. It's poor storytelling. We so, did not see anything. There's no line of dialogue to establish My this. only thing. So all I'm saying is you're giving a large leap of assumption and faith to just be like, oh yeah, she had to be trained. Hold on, or hold something. on. She knew how, she knew how to drive, and I'm riding a motorcycle that. is not a I'm, stretch from that, right? We saw her do that in the first movie. She could drive. She could know. How to be. Even though I think it's a big stress to be Look, learning how to drive a motorcycle, she was doing some daredevil type shit, like okay. on that bike. Like she was out there, and that I, I'll leave that alone. Leave but it alone. I don't even think stuff. that. I think that one is. I don't even. I think that would be a nitpick. If anything, that's that would fine. be a nitpick. I, I'll leave it. I'll throw it away. That's fine. The sure. fighting, though, I feel like they still. <laughs> one. She didn't line. do any fighting until the end. I know, but what I'm saying, one line could have at least been like, man, while she was grieving and she was angry, she was like fighting, or she was working with a core. I didn't even realize she was angry anything. until halfway through the movie, and she was like, "Oh, I wanted to burn all this stuff down." Like that whoa, didn't make sense. Where did that come <laughs> from? Because I was like, "Where?" I said the same thing. <laughs> what What did the world do to you? That make so here's the thing, because I know I've talked to other people on different podcasts and they would say stuff like, look, when you're going through grief, you know, like you experience this anger and stuff. So I understood where they were coming from. And I was like, that's great for you. But for those of us in the audience that experience grief differently or have not experienced, not experienced that, it, that's yeah. still the job of the movie to translate that to us so we can understand the character. It was, and I'm like, I didn't understand that leap of anger for her character to be like, whenever I think of uh, T'Challa, yes. I want to burn the world. That makes I mean, no sense. It, it should make sense. But I mean, so they didn't write it in. It is relatable to those who have grief because, you know, sure. she lost her mother, she lost her father, and she lost different. her brother. That's I different. hear you. Because when you get to the third act of the movie and you see, like, oh, he killed, you know, Namor killed her, that is easy to make the connection for yes. anyone to be yeah. like, Ooh, when she said, she when she said that line, mom, her mom was already that's dead. That's motivation. That when makes sense. When she said sense. that line, her mom was already dead. What? When she said she wanted to burn everything down, she her mom was had already passed. No, she said that in the very beginning. I heard her say that when she was talking to Killmonger. When that she was, was in already in the beginning. So in the very beginning, and like before they were in the, this is the benefit of watching it four times. Oh man! <laughs> when when you um before when they go on the death retreat, you yeah. know to like recover and everything. Um, that was the point where she told uh the mom, the queen asked her like, look. When you think about T'Challa, what do you think about? And she's like, I get so angry that I just want to burn the world and everyone in it. I, I don't remember. And that's when I was Maybe like, she said, I, I where don't did this come that. from? But I'm, I'm going to rewatch it. I'm going to rewatch it. Go, go ahead. I'm word. just saying, it comes at a very early point. Yeah, later so, it makes sense with the Killmonger connection, but so early, it was like, what? What? How did let's, you get to this point? Let's backtrack a little bit because we, we want to. I was kind of trying to emphasize the fact that they had a whole ensemble to help carry the load of the movie, and the way that they wrote it, Letitia Wright wasn't written in a way that she could do it by herself. Agreed, but right? they should have. They should have mm. pushed her. I think they should have elevated so her. That character. was them being More uncertain as to time. whether or not she would resonate with the audience. So they was like, "Yo, let's bring in Angela Bassett because we know." People's people's gonna love Angela Bassett. And she's I mean, gonna make these scenes listen, amazing. That, no, you that's, can't do that though. Then but that's if, what they if did. That's the case. But that's, that's what the they case, did. Don't put her in the movie. 
if that's the case, don't put her in the movie. Because Ooh, the Andrew? job of the director, listen, the job of the director, you're supposed to be in the driver's seat of mm-hmm. how we are supposed to connect and relate to characters. If we have a difficult time, that's because you didn't. He, he's also playing time. to the strengths of his tools, right? He's sitting there looking at his tools and he's like, uh, I'm going to bring in some Angela Bassett here. I'm going to bring in some uh, Michael B. Jordan here. I'm going to have Winston Duke speak up here. That's th- what he did. I'm going to have Namor be so it consuming that you don't even pay attention to all this other stuff that's not as strong. And that's What's the, the point job of the, of the lead director? character. She's top billing, by the way. Like when you look at the you know, billing, she is the number one actor on. The I list, agree, on the list. but I would look at the movie posters, and it's 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 her face th- is all over it. Her face her is face all is over them. One of them, I think, one. it was the IMAX one. It has Angela Bassett in the center, though. No, that she she is her. Uh, on every movie poster in the theaters, Shuri is the face on that. I, not disagreeing that her face isn't on it all i'm saying is on the imax posters they have angela bassett as the center and they'll have like letitia wright floating above her so i'm not saying that she's not the biggest face on there but i'm saying that they're clearly trying to emphasize angela bassett in this as well on the official disney site on their official posters it's shuri and everybody else is like in the background I I wouldn't just I'm just saying I wouldn't go off of just the IMAX because sometimes they have different variations, yeah. but the official Disney release, mm-hmm. it's Shuri and everybody else is like truncated after I, her. I, I I know the poster you're talking about. I know the post I'm just saying that's what Disney's put out as their official thing. <sighs> I'm not gonna make excuses. You know what I want to talk about? For Shuri. Like she needed more you know, time, but go what ahead. What else was I think was half cooked? Riri Williams. I didn't care. I mean, like I like Riri, but I wasn't like I need more Riri time because I know they're gonna do an Ironheart series. I, so. I agree, and I think like it's not, it's her, not movie. her movie, but she was. She's like one of those characters. Like remember we were talking about Doctor Strange, and I was like, you could kind of cut characters out, and it would be the same movie. You could cut Riri so, out almost. I think the biggest problem, and again, this goes back to the writing, the problem is not Riri Williams. The problem is the writing. Because the whole issue with Riri where she becomes kind of superfluous is with Namor. Because Namor was just like, we have to kill the scientists. And it was like, why? Like, the CIA already has her device. They already have the, the government has it already. Killing Riri is not going to well, the issue that Namor could, has. Now, you've seen the, the movie four world. times. I've only seen it once, but I was under the impression that she only made one device and they stole it. The CIA stole it and then Namor just um, destroyed it and brought it to it's Wakanda. It's not that they stole it. It's that she made the device for her class as a class Yeah, project. and then they took it. And the government was like, ooh, this is good. Yoink! And they took yeah, it and then way. when Namor and Wakanda found it, and um, Shuri broke it down, she's like, "Look, some of this stuff is like definitely like government equipment, but some of this stuff is like car parts. Like, this is the right. same one right. that she made in that garage. I mean, it's not like they had a copy." What of they're it. trying to establish is that obviously she's like a mini. This is another Stark, thing. Right? I was like, she's say. made something so advanced, so uh, unique that, like, for now, she's the best resource. <sighs> to redevelop it or to you know i just didn't it. like her story. but that doesn't mean somebody else can't come around eventually now nah, people have been trying to figure out how to make this stuff for a long time and how to detect vibranium and they haven't been able to do it it's kind of like the same mcguffin as the super soldier serum now don't get me wrong i mean they literally just found out about vibranium like recently uh, or at least this amount this maybe amount. maybe they thought it was a little drip yeah, here and there. but they didn't realize the that Wakanda was the power learned. that it was and how much they had and all the stuff they've been doing with it until Martin Freeman's character came back and told him, like, yo, Wakanda is the Jetsons, right? Um, Riri is an interesting character. I think they did a better job with her being a little side sideline character than they did with America Chavez and Doctor Strange 2. I think she was way better fleshed out in this. Um, 
it's just to me they borrowed way too much like i was saying before they borrowed from captain america with this one with riri i felt like they borrowed from spider-man far from home and riri was like the peter parker and shuri was like the tony stark right it was like mm. that relationship seems lifted and it was almost a beat for beat copy of those civil war moments when like tony just swoops in he's in awe of some of peter's inventions and accomplishments and then immediately swoops them away to go do some avenger shit riri is with it mm -hmm. even you know even even is is the same way and even helps to develop a new suit just the same way that tony stark helped peter create his new suit as a mentor you know, I, I get that they went with this because it worked before, but I'm, I think it was just lazy but effective writing. It was like they were sitting there, they were trying to figure out what to do with Riri, and they literally just, just borrowing from that whole other relationship and copy and pasted it into this movie. It works. It's just I think it was lazy. Sure. I mean, it's a missed opportunity. You know, it was a missed opportunity to uh, certainly... Um, make things a little bit more unique. I mean, this is a similar issue I had with uh, Namor. You know, the fact that they were like, they. I mean, they literally rehashed <laughs> Namor's origin. And I love the, the Mayan stuff. Oh, this is wrong. nothing like that the comics. Wonderful. I love this new origin. But the fact that, you know, he also has vibranium. He also has the heart-shaped herb. He also is very, very similar to Killmonger, yeah. you know, against the colonizer. I'm like, come on, man. Like, y'all could... The, I mean, the only difference with him between him and Killmonger is he's not out there trying to, like, become the oppressors, right? He's not trying to oppress the colonizers. He's like, yo, I want to defend my people and I want to be ready when that happens because it is going to happen. But outside of that, my man was Killmonger, like, to be fair, that's like, a common point of view and perspective on the world from a lot of people, right? It's not like, right? I Killmonger it. had this I get view. It. I'm just saying, like, with the whole heart shaped herb thing and all, I'm like, y'all. I would say they did enough differences I, because it's not like he was mad or wanted revenge for his dad dying from the Wakandans, right? right. They, he was more like, you know, I'm just trying to protect my people, but I draw the line and in I, the sand I like that. harshly. Even as a kid, you will all die if I see you messing with my people the wrong way. I respect that because that is definitely different from Killmonger. Killmonger was an I totally get that. I totally get that. Now, I guess these are other issues I have. It's kind of like, how the hell does he hear everything? Yeah. He's yeah. all the way under the sea. But my he man's like, everything. hey, you know uh, T'Challa, your boy went to the UN and gave a speech. And I'm like, bro, he were you there? Fish in the room. Like, you know he could talk to fish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nah, nah. Right. But truth be told, I can only imagine that there's spies somewhere. Either that or they have. How? Well, I, I don't know, but they can breathe? I can only imagine that it's like the same way they mimic Wakanda with Talo Khan. Wakandans have spies everywhere. That was established in the first Black Panther movie. It was like. Brad. Black Panther had spies everywhere, all over the world. I get that. That part so, I get. But at this point, I'm just sitting there like. I still don't understand how Talakans know how to do anything. I don't understand how they can be so informed of the surface world when they are so deep. I mean, they are so deep. As he said, all the water pressure would break your bones and all this stuff. Like, but bro, he's how are you always cognizantly aware of what's going on. He's always making sure he knows what the surface world is doing. I don't. They didn't explain exactly how he was spying on them. But he, they did establish that point. he's spying on everybody. He even has, and the scary part is he even has spies in Wakanda because he knew what the Wakandans were doing. No, he didn't. He knew no, he didn't. The River Tribe. Wh what was their point? What? The whole uh, thing with uh, and that. Th this is my issue is the fact that they dumbed down Wakanda. They dumbed down Wakanda for the sake of moving the plot forward. The fact that my man came through, snuck in, yep. he snuck in, uh, you know, yeah. through the river, and then what happened? What did the queen say? Yo, he just infiltrated, and Okoye was like, oh, that will never happen again. And I believed her, because that's the way Wakanda usually works. You might surprise us, but you ain't going to get us yeah. twice. And then they literally do it again. And I'm sitting there like, what? what is the purpose of the river tribe? <laughs> Why are y'all here? 
I know they clowned y'all the first time, but then y'all let them come in again. What is going on? And the only reason y'all let them go in is because of the plot. Because you had to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Namor come in and attack Wakanda and all. And I'm just like, nope. there were so many L's that were forced on the country of Wakanda. It, it bothered me. The fact that they couldn't figure out this mysterious illness that T'Challa had when this is the country that has cured damn near everything. Someone who is almost fatally wounded by a bullet wound or cancer, at least from the comics, they can't they, they cure that a long time ago. But now, ah, we got a challenge. We can't do it because plot. Then you let these people come into your country multiple times. Well, I guess you're not the war power country that we thought you were. And then I'm <laughs> the, the final act, the yeah, final act off. was probably the dumbest thing he's I've ever off. seen. The fact that you I love the, the plan that they came out with to, you know, dry out Namor, oh, weaken great. him, isolate. Beautiful. I'm like. That's what I expect from Shuri to come up with something, and Riri, by the way, to come up with a game plan, be resourceful, use the technology. I love that. But you mean to tell me that Wakanda, after dealing with these people, your game plan to escape the sea people was to swim away in your big Wakanda ship in the sea? From the sea, uh, yeah, people? that was that was. Y'all didn't think about like I don't know, beam them, beam us up, Scotty. Uh, yo, when you didn't think about maybe, I, I'll should... admit when that Nothing? scene happened, I thought that was what was going to happen. I thought sh- ships were going to swoop in from I the sky. Everybody was going to get taken away on an escape ship. I didn't think they was going to turn the boat around and just sail to safety. I was like, they was like, okay, Wakanda, let's go back to the country, and then they was just like, we're just going to swim away from the sea yeah. people. Yo, they came in on a whole a whale. Few of them. Killer whales. They came in. They brought Shamu and his friends. And y'all thought y'all was going to just swim Rain away? Smoke. This is what I'm talking about with bad writing. This was dumb. Now, is here's the thing. You can give... I'm not saying Wakanda has to be perfect. You can have people be outsmarted yep. because they just are not familiar with the enemy. And you can have them be overpowered because, again, they might not be familiar. But you cannot sit here and make what, you know, Wakanda dumb. This feels with this stupid escape plan, just so you could bring in some water balloons and explode them. I hope later this is on. one like, of those things insane. Marvel goes in and fills in later, right? Like we've seen them do that plenty of times. They just leave I, little I holes really and they will. just come back and fill it in later. Oh, the reason I don't. I I think that I think they were like, no, we told the story. Let's so, move on because. Uh, there were so many plot holes in this story, Ooh. and it, even if it's not an actual plot a, hole, there were so many weaknesses. I got in a the plot script. hole. I got one. Okoye, when she was fighting on the bridge, that bridge mm. scene was amazing. She's sitting there. She's fighting right against three Talokans by herself. She's beating them up with her spear, yep. and then she stabbed one of them in the chest. And my yep. man got up and walked off. Just walked off. And then. Yeah. At the, but at the beginning of the movie, we saw this lady running away from them with a regular gun. Okoye had a vibranium spear. She shot them with lead bullets, and they went down. <laughs> yes. Yes. What's the difference? In the same spot. Like, why didn't that hurt them? They're different. Oh, they, they're immune to vibranium. And, but and, lead and I love the weakness. fact that they like, just, like, laid on the ground. Until the Tuma told them to get up. Yeah. I'm, I'm a, I, I... Here's the funnier thing. Again, when you go rewatch all of this, it's even funnier that when they're on the boat scene in the third act, the way that they defeat the sea people is by hitting them and punching them back into the sea. Now, you know, like, if you were fighting like a regular person... Be like, yeah, that person would probably drown from their wounds, they dead, whatever. You just put them back in their strength. So, like, they will just come back. I don't know if the Atlanteans gain strength in the water the same way Namor does. He's a mutant. Talokan. 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 Excuse me, Atlanteans. Yeah. The, Tal- the Talokans. It, he's a mutant. He established that right off the bat. He's, he's like, no, mutant. I'm a mutant. Yeah. Here's some of my mutant powers. I got feathers on my feet. I yeah. can fly. yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm strong. I'm as strong as the whole. Apparently, super hearing. Super hearing. He's, he's got all these supernatural abilities that the rest of them don't have. So, 
to be fair, if they got hit hard enough and knocked in the water, I don't think the water is going to rejuvenate them the same way it does him. I'm not saying that it would rejuvenate them. I'm just saying, like, it's not going to stop them. No, they should definitely climb back up. And by the time, by the time, That's- now, to be fair, on that same boat scene, you could tell that the Wakandans went down through, you know, by means of attrition. By the time it, this last scene ended, there was like a handful of Wakandans left. Like they got squashed. I, you know what? That's that's also kind of been an issue of mine. I'm like, I have no idea how many Wakandans there are. Like they play with these numbers <laughs> so often. I'd be like, look, are you, do y'all have like 200 people or like 20? Because I, I sometimes like they just be well, changing. To be fair. And to be fair, they, they, they've they gone through a few wars, right? They, they've lost some soldiers, they right? Civil they, but even in the other Civil War, in they the had first the Civil movie, War, they uh, had the Infinity War, and then they had the Endgame yeah. War. They, they've been through a That's few true. wars. Their numbers might be diminished. This is another reason why I'm like, would y'all please leave Wakanda alone? <laughs> like, let, like, I need a generation or two to grow up so we can repopulate Cause I'm like, yeah. golly, like the, the numbers just be numbers dwindling, man. Down. It's like it's like four dudes from the Jabari tribe, that's and that's it. it. Ain't nobody else left. It's, it's Mbaku and that's his it. buddies. That's it. <sighs> Gee, the same door, Malaje. They ain't they ain't, they ain't add nobody to that. They rank. they added. Did they add some people? Oh, maybe uh, uh, Ao's yeah, uh, girlfriend, girlfriend or whatever. She's new, right? Okay. Yeah, and 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 that was cool. But apparently she's always been there. She I might know. have been there. I she know. might. I think she know. might have been in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Soldier. I don't know. I gotta I go back and check. Um, mm-hmm. The Dora Milaje. I loved. I know a lot of people hated it. I loved the idea of seeing the Midnight Angels because I liked it. I don't know what people didn't uh, like. So I know what people didn't like, and I think it kind of cheapened it for me too. Which was the last mm-hmm. scene in the um, with the Koye fighting against uh, what's his name the the Talakan general Atuma. Atuma, yeah, like I wanted that mm-hmm. rematch to be straight up, right? This was like ah, oh, I put on some How? Iron Man armor. He's overpowered. He's not. She needed the suit. She needed. I the mean, suit. I saw her fight against Proxima Midnight and hold her own. Who's also super powered. As strong as I don't know, Proxima Midnight was doing some stuff. She was, but I don't think she was built up. I mean, first of all, the MCU's power scaling is terrible. (laughs) But (laughs) I don't think I think a lot of this was more so to establish how strong and how formidable Atuma is. Because let's not forget, he is going to be Namor's, uh, uh, you know, antagonist at some point too. Yeah. So you do want to make sure that that with Namor, the future. Antagonist to Namor can hold his own. Power scaling. He's definitely he was. It was definitely a boss fight. I kind of get it to the degree that when she lost the first time, I just wanted her to come back with like some other type of preparation than some some armor. Oh. Right? It was like, oh, let's just Tony Stark it out and figure it out from there. Nah, they got to set up her uh, Disney Plus series. I like that. She used the suit. I hope that she gives it up to Ao's girlfriend, um, like like they did in the comics. Got, it's gonna yeah, be them it's them two. two. It's and I want them two. to want revenge on Wakanda. That's what I'm hoping from a Black Panther three that they become the antagonist. That nah, was pulled straight out of the happen. comics. That's exactly what happened in I the comics. Know. Those two literally became villains because they was um, disenfranchised after being kicked. Well, I don't think they got kicked out of the Dora Milaje. I'm going to have to reread it again. But they did have beef with the um, T'Challa and the way that he was governing. So they were, like, forming a mutiny against Wakanda. Well, he's gone, so there goes that. And I'm pretty sure Shuri got, like, an emergency off switch <laughs> somewhere. Same way they disarm uh, Bucky. So uh, I, I, good luck. You know, I'm. You know what? I'm. I'm gonna save that for part two. I'm gonna save that for part two because okay. there's a lot. We are gonna do a absolutely, part two? absolutely, right? Because okay. there's a lot there that I want to talk about with the suits, the off suit, the possible future, the whole thing with Okoye getting kicked out of the Dora Milaje. All of that, I would definitely want to touch on. Um, Nakia, and oh, and Namor. We didn't really talk about Namor much, but. Definitely got to do Listen, a part. Listen, there's a lot to get into. 
Okay. Anyway, that's all we have time for this time. This is our initial reaction for Wakanda Forever. Be ready for us to do our second part where we go even deeper into these main story beats that happen throughout the movie and see what you see if you guys agree with our opinion which one of us have the correct opinion or if you have an opinion of your own yeah anyway that's all i have for this one <laughs> as usual if you guys like these videos you want to see more please do us a favor hit that like button make sure you subscribe otherwise we'll check you guys later peace check it out yeah of it don't ever let the chance pass you by just keep your eye up on the prizes life keeps spinning these rules i break them life keeps spinning them risks i take them run way to a bag